Welcome to the D&D Fitness Radio Podcast, brought to you by your hosts, Don Saladino from New York City and Derek Hansen from Vancouver, Canada. Dr. Nick, what's going on, brother? Not much. How are you, Don? Good, man. Good to see you. So I'm connecting you with Derek Hansen right now, one of my really good friends, podcast partner. Mm -hmm. And... um, He's, uh, Derek's a uh, very well-known running mechanics coach based out of Vancouver. We got connected nice. years ago at one of my clubs, Yeah, uh, be- became great friends, decided to start this podcast because we just like talking and we like that, you know, nice. so, uh, running, so- run, running mechanics is fascinating to me. I, I, I'm sure he can tell me more about it than, than I can, but pose running is something I've been trying to nail down recently because I, I, I hate running, man. It, it takes a lot out of me. I'll, I'll yeah. over to there. there was a somebody posted something that says running feels great unless you compare it to not running um exactly right i'm like yeah okay i can't argue yeah. with that yeah 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 i've definitely talked with other people in my crossfit gym about it and i think it's a height thing man it's like once you get over a certain height and a certain weight the from a physics standpoint the amount of work that you need to impart on your uh through your body rather to run 800 meters, 1200 meters, 1600 meters. It's so much harder. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I do think obviously like all things in the human body, we can become more efficient, right? If you just do it more. But I I think with running way too many people fixate on, Oh, I can run because everybody can run. I have legs, I can run, but I don't think people really, I think it, it would serve a lot more people if they understood that running is a skill you need to, you need to, you need to refine it. You need to uh, make it efficient. And then obviously then you can add on top of it. Well, it's like yeah, anything think, else, right? So, sorry, Derek. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say like Usain Bolt broke a lot of barriers in terms of like tall people being able to run. So yeah. 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 Definitely. So I, I mean, what I, what I look at is also, it's even like training, right? I mean, you, you, you start loading dysfunction at a certain time, which many people do out there, right? They're unable to get into specific positions They start loading it and they're like, okay, that's Mm -hmm. fine. I think what you're saying is exactly the same thing. It's like, you're going to like, is is running bad for you? Is it running by a person that hasn't earned the right to run bad for them? You know? And I think that's pretty cool. So Dr. Nick, can you just give us a little background? Like I I, I love you and I, what's interesting is you, Derek, every once in a while you meet someone and like, you just start talking and you're like, all right, like how long have I known this person for? Like you did. That's kind of what happened to me and Dr. Nick a few weeks ago at the strong event. We, he was pointing at me. I thought he was pointing at someone else. We kind of start talking. The next, you know, we're having conversations. He's referring me someone. I'm getting him on the podcast. No, but seriously, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Because we're in an industry where there's so many people and you, you know who the good people are. You suddenly get connected with them. And then out of nowhere, you're, you know, doing business together and life is good. But can you give us a little background? Like how did Dr. Nick become Dr. Nick? I, I want to hear this. Yeah. Yeah. But Derek, let me, let me clarify something to you that, uh, <laughs> that that Don didn't just say so basically what happened was he so I gave my speech because I was the first speech uh in the first presentation in the morning and then I get a random Instagram DM after my after my after my speech and I'm like who's this Don Saladino has tagged you on his story I'm like um okay let me check this out I I see a picture of myself oh thanks for the presentation today so a couple hours later I'm sitting down on a bench with my girlfriend, we're talking, and I see Don walking up the stairs. I point at Don, Don, and he looks at me like, "Who the hell is this black guy?" I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, in my mind, in my mind, I'm like, "You just tagged me. What are you talking about? You just saw me." So, and obviously, then Don told me what was going on. I guess his wife either had his phone or she was logged into his Instagram account, and she was the one who made that. Post. No, so, and it's exactly, yeah. it's kind of exactly what happened. I was running around <laughs> taking some meetings, and I said, "Do me a favor." There's a few speakers go in, take some, you know, take some po- uh, uh, picks and, and throw them up and tag them on. And she's like, done. Right. And, right. you know, because we like to, you know, we like to Multitask. shine a light on all the good. Yeah, we like to yeah. shine a light on, on, on good people. And I think it's something yeah. where, yes, like in the industry, we need to do that. And, and she helped me out. So, but it was funny because you were walking up the stairs. I was with a group of people. So you were pointing and I was, yeah. just, I was a little fuzzy. I was like, you know, I'm in classes <laughs> now, man. I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm going, is that guy pointing at me? And you know, that's happened yeah. to you before. And I don't know where you're yeah. like, no, man. It's done, done. It's a good thing Mel wasn't talking shit on her post. And then he comes up and punches you. 
Yeah, no. my, <laughs> never, my wife's never never. spoken shit about anyone, but no, it was, it was good, good to get man. it was good to get connected. But give us a little history right now. We, we, sure. we want to hear about it. Sure. Um. So yeah, my name's uh, my name's Nick. Um, formerly Doctor Nabuese, uh, but I I go by informal. So let's drop the formal. Um. Uh. Yeah, Nick. I I graduated. Um. So kind of growing up, I I went to I'm a uh, mechanical engineer by undergrad. So I graduated from the College of uh, engineering, Michigan State University. Uh, after that, I decided to not pursue a, a vocation, a, a career in engineering, and instead uh, uh, reoriented towards med school. Uh, took, I don't know, about a year, or however long to study for the um, entrance exam for medical school, which is called the MCAT. Uh, took the MCAT, passed it, uh, applied to a number of med schools, got a number of interviews. Uh, funny enough, I think this is actually the first time I'm going to say this in any podcast interview. The reason why I chose OSU, College of Medicine, instead of any other uh, uh, school that I got admitted to was their gym. I literally, like even back then, I literally like, oh, you know, I'm doing the interview and blah, blah. I'm like, hey, can you guys show me your gym? So they take me to the RPAC, the OSU RPAC. And it is huge, Don. Like just all the equipment, I fall in love. I mean, basically this school moves up a couple tiers in my mind immediately as compared to every other school, simply because their gym was amazing. And obviously, you know, I knew that was something that I wanted to focus on as much as med school studies would allow. So yeah, uh, got admitted into OSU College of Medicine, uh, went through the hell that med school was not only for me, but I think for most people for whom uh, you know, they would describe school before med school as being easy. Med school is definitely a, a slap in the face. It's, 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 it's a, a, one of the best analogies that I've ever heard to describe it is that it's a fire hose. You have to drink from a fire hose from literally day one. They pour it on you and people crumble initially. People crumble midway through. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was hell, but I, I graduated and, and um, I remember one of the attendings who I came across in med school, uh, I believe in first year or second year. And to keep this in mind, you really don't decide what you want to do with any conviction until third year or fourth year. But one of my attendings in first year and second year, he looked at me and he said, you're going to be a primary care doctor. You're going to be a, you're going to do primary care, family medicine, internal medicine, whatever, but you're going to be primary care. <clears throat> and I looked at him and I was like, how the hell could you possibly make that assertion, you know, with any degree of certainty, given that it's just my first year of med school. And he said, because you're, you're normal. I was like, what? He was like, cause you can talk to people. You can, he was like, just the conversation we're having, you can easily connect with people. And there are so many types of doctors and I can name them off radiologists, pathologists, surgeons, who unfortunately uh, I don't know if it's their personality kind of um, kind of points them in the direction of those specialties, but for all intents and purposes, there are doctors in certain specialties who are simply not able to talk to patients, not able to connect with patients, and instead either like patients when they're you know when they're dead, <laughs> when they're when they're kind of you know they're just evaluating slides under a mi microscope, or when they're unconscious and asleep, or or uh, you know, like an anesthesiologist or a surgeon. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, that, that attending doctor who told me that in my first or second year was correct. I did end up choosing uh, primary care medicine uh, simply because I, I really like connecting with patients. I like, I, I found a certain amount of joy in um, having heart to hearts with conversation or heart to hearts with patients rather, where I would you know, explore their lifestyle, ask them a lot of insightful questions, know, be aware in my mind of when I should shut the hell up and let them talk and let them talk to their heart's content. And then after they're done talking and telling me everything, kind of sit back, analyze the situation, and then give them my recommendation. So um, yeah, I've definitely enjoyed primary care medicine since, uh, since graduation. And um, 
Uh, so yeah, after OSU College of Medicine, then I went to residency in Illinois. Uh, my I went to uh, I lived in uh, uh, Naperville, Illinois, and my Hinsdale, uh, my residency was in Hinsdale, Illinois. And um, since then, I have moved to Colorado and currently live uh, currently live here, practicing uh, full spectrum medicine, um, primarily through uh, a company known as. Um, uh, steady MD, uh, lemonade primary care, but also uh, in ancillary fashions uh, locally as as I see fit. So, so how did you get into? So how I mean, you are like the fitness doctor though in a way. Like you almost remind me of like you you have this passion for fitness. Is mm-hmm. anything that you're doing beyond primary care because you don't really seem like a typical primary care doctor. I got to be honest. I mean. You don't fall into that stereotype. Like your family doc- doctor doesn't look like Nick. No, <laughs> my family <laughs> doctor does not. Look, I wish, you know, I, I wish my family doctor looked like Nick though. And, and, and sometimes, you know, you go into family doctors and it, you know, what's interesting is you do feel a bit of a disconnect with a few of them. I'm actually in between sure. family doctors right now. One of one that I really liked a lot that I only had for about a year because I lived in the city and then I was commuting in the city to see my, primary care doctor. And then I came out to Long Island, got connected with a great primary uh, care doctor named Dr. Robin Thompson, who ended up retiring a year after she took me on as a patient. And now I'm like in limbo with a couple of names that I'm going to go see. But I I feel like sometimes that there is this disconnect. I feel like you do go in and, you know, you're speaking to their internist, right? And then the doctor's kind of rolling in. It's like speed dating. It's like, all right, all right, let's go, let's go. And I feel like just there's so much more. And I, I typically would have my primary care doctor and then I have a functional medicine doctor I work with because I like to do a little bit more of a deeper dive. Like, sure. do you, do you find yourself sometimes saying, you know, primary care is, is only there's certain tests that are covered under insurance and there's, there's a deeper dive that we need to go, but you just can't because it may not be part of the typical protocol. Or do you feel like you have enough information based off of, um, you know, what you're testing, what you're seeing when they come in. Just, it's a simple question, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand where you're getting at. Um, So essentially what you're alluding to is, uh, to be honest, Don, I think we touched on this a little bit, you know, in New York, but in my opinion, medicine is broken in this country for exactly the reason you just spoke about. Um, You know, unfortunately, you know, it's been called a medical industrial complex. And I think for good reason. Uh, and that's not necessarily to point the finger at doctors. I'm absolutely not. I, I know not just the other med students I went to med school with, but the, the doctors I graduated with. I know the motives, the underlying motives of many doctors that gives them the motivation and the, the drive necessary to complete four years of an arduous process instead of just saying, hey, hell, I'm done with this. Like the, the debt, the, the, you know, the loans are ridiculous anyway. I'm, I'm out, right? Most, most doctors go into medicine with a good heart and they know why they're, they're doing it uh, fundamentally. However, what they often don't anticipate is the fact that when you take that vocation, when, when, uh, you know, when you get that job, when you land that job, it immediately becomes uh, a numbers game for not for you, but for the employer, where exactly what you just alluded to, where you feel like you're just, you see the doctor and things are being rushed. That is absolutely happening because in the background uh, we have targets and these targets are set by, by administrators above us, performance metrics, right? Um, This type of medicine is called, the the type of model is called fee for service. And, you know, it's, it's essentially, exactly what you spoke to where you know the insurance companies will pay will will essentially we have to make sure as doctors that the things that we're ordering whether it's imaging or labs even vitamin d vitamin d is a very good one where i know how expansive the role of vitamin D is in the human body yet you will literally have insurers try to deny the claim and deny payment when you order that on an annual physical for a patient, right? So it's definitely a minefield that you have to navigate as a doctor. And if I were to sit here and tell you that navigating that minefield did not impede best 
care for the patient, I would be lying to you. I absolutely think that it does. Um, so personally, I've just, you know, chosen to opt out. And what I mean by that is, as I stated earlier, F, uh, FFS, fee for service, is just one model. There's another model called direct primary care. And that's what I'm doing right now with Lemonade Primary Care, uh, powered by SteadyMD. And the on, uh, kind of what that means through and through is that going to see your doctor now is essentially with, with direct primary care, not fee for service, but with direct primary care, going to see your doctor is essentially akin to a gym membership. You pay a certain amount per month. And then in that month, you can see them as many times as you want. Uh, and because you have that, because the doctor now has this uh, flexibility with the patient, given the fact that kind of they can, they can come in and see you, they can, they can make appointments as many times as they want. Uh, it, what I found is that it makes the relationship closer um, and it makes the patient much more likely to bring up issues with you before those issues cascade into worse issues. Because all too often with fee-for-service, how many times have I come across a patient who's like, oh, you know, this started a month and a half, two months ago. I didn't bring it in until now because, you know, I, I tried to fix it on my own or I was hoping it would get better. And, and the undertone, the undertone message, the, the subtext that isn't necessarily said is that they are aware that they are under a fee for service, um, fee for service kind of platform where if they come into the doctor, you know, they have to do a copay. They then have to, you know, potentially pay if, if any of their labs or any imaging, you know, isn't covered. So I think ultimately, yeah, you you speak to an issue that many Americans are aware of that I fundamentally believe that healthcare in general, right? Like I said, there's an alternative, there's direct primary care, but in general, in this country, healthcare is broken and it essentially incentivizes uh, uh, sick care instead of health care. And th that's an issue for anybody like me who's very preventative focus, preventative medicine focus, as opposed to, as opposed to, you know, only thinking about, as, I'm sorry, I, I cut out there for a second, as opposed to only thinking about, um, uh, okay, you know, patient has something wrong, fix, fix this, right? I, I think the, I, I messaged somebody or somebody rather messaged me on Instagram recently about this and was trying to become my patient. And I let him know, right? Just because of the questions that he was asking me, I, I let him know very directly that I don't think that I'd be the best patient or the best doctor for him because he seems to look at medicine through a very reactive lens, right? Oh, this is happening. Let me go see the doctor and we'll we'll try and get taken take we'll try to get it taken care of instead of um prevention of uh, somebody who's preventative uh focus is gonna say, hey doc, I feel great. You know, I want, here's, here are various aspects of my lifestyle. You know, we could review labs if you'd like. I'd like to figure out where I can optimize, what I can improve, how I can lessen my chance for disease in the future, instead of waiting for that disease to occur and then trying to, to fix it. So, um, yeah, I, I hope I answered that question. The, the oh, question you had, yeah, beautiful. the question you had before that, that preceded that was, um, how did you get into fitness i think you said well or... fitness is probably it's, it seems like when, when you get into it it's a love right or or or, or at least most people are pushing in that direction but with you i'm sensing this has just been a love and a passion of yours no no so um don you have i think i remember on uh, seeing on your instagram you have teenagers right yeah i got a 15 year old girl and a four seem to be 14 year old boy Okay. So yeah, my dad, when I was about the age of your son, 14, he was trying to get me off the video games, man. He was like, come to the YMCA with me. I was like, no, why? Let me play video games. Leave me alone. And he just kept at it. And I would go and I would hate it. And he would make me go into the sauna and lift weights and blah, blah. And um, at that time, I was uh, really focused on because my my only training other than, you know, sporadic gym sessions with my dad in high school was Taekwondo. So I, I got a black belt in Taekwondo in, in high school. But I did notice that lifting weights facilitated Taekwondo. And I was I was stronger. I was faster. I had more endurance, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it definitely took, I'm not going to lie, it took some years to um, 
get me to the, for my dad to get me to the point where going to the gym was something that he wouldn't drag me along in the car, you know, so we would go, but I would instead get in the car myself and be like, I'm going to the YMCA. Right. Um, so that's kind of how it started for me. Uh, and then, you know, and the, I remember the progression, right? One day I was watching the uh, television and the Olympics were on. And I remember seeing some 130, 140 pound, you know, Asian woman, uh, uh, Chinese, if I remember correctly, clean and jerk over 250 pounds, just a ridiculous amount of weight, right? That in my mind, I was like, how is a small woman moving that much weight? So I decided to try and teach myself that at the YMCA. Uh, doing cleans and it was very very difficult and I, I you know even though I was over six feet uh, six foot tall at that time at my size I couldn't move the same weight that this little woman was moving so I I was very I I was intrigued right um to say the least and uh, you know uh then getting into engineering um I kept going to the gym but continue just doing my own thing just kind of bodybuilding at the gym uh uh definitely not putting on much mass because as anybody with, you know, your, your acumen, when it comes to fitness knows the name of the game, the fundamental name of the game, when it comes to fitness, any type of fitness is progressive overload. But as a kid, as well, not a kid, as a teenager, as, as, as a young adult, I didn't, I didn't know that I didn't know how to design a program. Hell, to this day, I still tell my patients, I don't know how to design a program. Don't come to me for that. Go, go to people who know better, who are trainers who have studied this and have a lot of experience. Um, so anyway, yeah, at that age, you know, uh, kind of being a, uh, a young adult, I simply didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and, uh, but I just kept at it and just kept kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall <laughs> and uh, just doing whatever I could. So um, got getting into med school, I uh, didn't want to continue Krav Maga and I'm sorry I didn't want to continue Taekwondo anymore uh simply because you know I wanted to try something new and I knew that I would need an hour uh at least an hour a day of some something fitness oriented because otherwise I would be spending 18 hours a day studying mm -hmm. and I knew that I would absolutely murder myself if I kept doing that I needed I needed some type of relief so um I just basically used the gym to decompress from studying uh, and went to went to Krav Maga and trained and uh, the uh, specific uh, Krav Maga gym I was at was called Ohio Krav Maga and Fitness and um, one day a gentleman there I still remember his name Eric Holt he saw me uh, sparring and, and just kind of doing you know the Krav Maga stuff on one side of the gym and he said hey why don't you come join us you look like you'd be good at this thing that we're doing over here uh, and I asked him, you know, what is that? He was like, oh, we're, we're doing CrossFit. And um, I'm, I looked at him, I was like, absolutely not. Like, I, I observe you guys and you all look like you hate, like after the workout, you're all on the ground. You're all staring at the ceiling. You all look like you hate your life in unison. Why would I want, like, wh wh how is that appetizing or attractive? Um, however, he knew I would keep coming to the gym for Krav. So he just kept on me after, you know, three or four months. And uh uh, after approximately that amount of time, I decided to give it a shot. And I tried it thinking that I would have, you know, some element of fitness already from Krav and CrossFit absolutely destroyed me. It kicked my butt. Um, however, I did have to choose at this point, do I continue with Krav or continue with CrossFit? Because I can't do both. I simply, I'm not dedicating two hours a day to the gym when I should be studying, when I should be using one of those hours, one of those two hours to, to study. Um, so I ended up choosing what I, in my opinion, was the best choice to keep me fit for the long term. And I chose CrossFit. And so I've been doing CrossFit now for over 13 years or over 12 or 13 years. And, um, you know, in terms of kind of what has really developed my passion for fitness and developed my passion for the application of fitness for one's overall health, right? Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in the CrossFit sickness, health, fitness continuum. And that essentially kind of the, the closer you move the lever to fitness, to, to optimal fitness, the healthier you are going to be and the more you get away from sickness. So um, yes, essentially over the last 10 or 13 years, that's really what has crafted my love for 
fitness, not just of CrossFit. I, I tell my patients all the time, you don't have to cross it. I am not, as I, as I stated it in strong New York, I'm not dogmatic. I don't believe that there's only one way. I, I think that that's nonsense. I think the best solution for anybody is to find the answer that they can be most consistent with over the long term, because that's any of this, whether we're talking bodybuilding, Pilates, calisthenics, CrossFit, this is only effective. Any one of these is only effective over the long term. You have to be consistent. So if you're doing something, let's say you jump into a cross the gym and you feel that it's not for you and you cannot sustain it, don't waste your time. Drop it, right? And uh, that's that's my same approach towards uh towards towards dietary intervention. So um, anyway, I feel like I, I try to address both questions that you ask. But if that's um, perfect, if yeah, I'm kick cool. it to Derek. No, it's perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, certainly you you appear to be a, an atypical primary care physician so um after we've gone through covid like one of the I, i'm from canada so there's some different issues around healthcare here and, and it's not price but it's maybe access and, and 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 timeliness of access but i was wondering like have you come up with some creative ways you talked about more of a subscription based service um where you can um address some of these issues like i, I wish i could just you know jump on a call quickly with my physician and say like, Hey, this is, you know, here's some photos of that rash I have. Can we just take care of it that way? But they want me to make an appointment, go there. And then I'm, I'm just, you know, it's wasting my time and it's probably inefficient too, but are there more creative ways you talk about prevention where you can get this information out or access, you know, that relationship with the patient to make things more efficient and cost effective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll be honest here in the previous jobs that I had that were fee for service based um, that operated under the fee for service model. Uh, what you just mentioned, Eric, is exactly why we want the patient to, to come in. Because listen, uh, everything in this life costs something, right? Absolutely everything. And in one way or another, it's either a monetary exchange or it's some, some type of value exchange, right? And when you are having an issue and you message your doctor and your doctor, you know, he or she is like, come in, what they're wanting to do, number one, is they want to be thorough, obviously. I think I think it's 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 important to to always want to be thorough with your patients. But number two, it's also important when when you simply message your doctor and you just want an answer over the phone in a fee for service based model, I'm not talking about direct primary care in a fee for service based model, what you're actually asking them to do is, hey, give me advice on this, uh, and there'll be no compensation. Basically, your time, you're, you're, you're literally saying your time is irrelevant, your time has no value, because we all only have 24 hours in a day, you know, your time has no value. And I basically need some of your time and your knowledge, and you get nothing in return. So I understand fee for service doctors saying, okay, I want to be thorough, but I also want fair compensation for the evaluation and the and the recommendation that I'm going to give you. So please come in. Now let's flip this. Let's flip the script with direct primary care. Often in in my personal case, right, I see patients with telemedicine and they can message me from wherever in the world they are, and I can I can help them whether it's advice or or medications, but. Um, there, there is essentially because because it's a different model. There's no barrier to uh, knowledge disbursement. There's no barrier to me giving you my time immediately without asking you to come in and and see me. Simply because we're under a different model. You're you're literally paying me however much per month, like a gym membership, and you know, in doing so, you're respecting my time. Obviously, I'm respecting your time and your health by giving you, you know, uh, uh, good, um, good, good recommendations and, and good advice. Uh, so I think ultimately, what I would recommend, because obviously, this isn't a podcast for, for doctors, this is a podcast for people who potentially could, could be patients, what I would recommend is simply doing your research, finding out whoever your doctor is that that you want to go to, are they under a fee-for-service model or are they under a direct primary care model? The type of model will absolutely facilitate the parameters of the care that they can give you. Another thing that 
Don alluded to, which I agree to, or which I agree with rather, and, and I'm going to reaffirm it here is, I think one thing that is very important that so many patients don't know the value of and so many doctors don't necessarily understand the value of until they butt heads with their patients is alignment. I think it's very important to have a doctor and a patient who Listen, it's not. I'm not over here saying you need to agree on everything, but I am saying that uh, you know, if if I'm the type of doctor who I I you know, you guys have already um, picked up about me in terms of how I like to practice, and then I come across a patient who literally tells me, "Oh, you know what, doctor? Not only do I not want to exercise, I'm not interested in starting. Oh, you're recommending that I walk 30 minutes around my home daily? No, that's too much." Like that type of patient, if it, even in their first appointment, if I picked up in our conversation that that is their mindset and that is their approach towards not just fitness, but other, other, other aspects of health, other aspects of wellness, if I pick that up from them, just inferring it from their, converse, or from their conversation with me, I would literally tell them, we are not going to be a good match. I, I wish the best for you, but I think you should find another another doctor because I can immediately tell that I am not aligned with them and they are not aligned with me as opposed to somebody who may not exercise at all, but is at least open and amenable to my recommendations is not... Uh, is not a contrarian, right? Won't sit here and push back on everything that I recommend uh, simply because it's not something that they would have thought of. I mean, that's a whole point of going to a doctor. You're, you're going to somebody who is going to recommend things to you that you may not have thought of. So if you're the type of person to push back on certain recommendations simply because they don't fit within your preordained lifestyle, then that to me means that you know, you don't have alignment with your doctor. So someone like Don, right, he needs a doctor who understands the value of fitness and understands that if Don comes in the future with, I don't know, a, a sore, a, a pulled quad from lifting from, I don't know, doing hip thrusts or doing squats, um, you, you, you do not, if you're the type of doctor, I'm sorry, if you're the type of person like Don is, or like you are, Derek, if you're the type of person who's very active. You do not want a doctor who you will come in with some musculoskeletal issue. And that doctor knows, oh, he lifts weights or he, he runs. I'm going to tell him you need to stop lifting weights. I'm going to tell him you need to stop running. Oh, you pulled your leg running. You need to stop running. That's not a solution. Right. Yeah. And, and you need to understand that that doctor, the reason they're giving you that answer is because they are fundamentally not aligned with you. And because they're not aligned with you, they're going to say stupid things like I, how many times have I had patients who have literally come to me and told me, oh, yeah, Dr. Nick, I'm interested in you because you're familiar with CrossFit. And I've literally had patient I've literally had doctors tell me not to CrossFit just because I have some little nag, some little injury that is easily recoverable from. But the doctor uses that as an opportunity to say, hey, you need to stop CrossFit or you need to stop running or you need to stop lifting weights. They almost generalize. They almost generalize too quickly, right? Like, and I, don't exactly. cut, I don't mean to cut in there, but like- No, you're right. I, this is something I'm very, I'm almost very, I don't want to use the word passionate about it. It almost disturbs me a little bit because- I, when someone gets injured, like there's, in, in my eyes, there's really two options, right? I'm either going to send them to an orthopedist, depending on how serious the injury is, or, you know, a lot of times I could send them to a physical therapist and say, listen, this is a friend of mine. They're going to take a, you know, a look at you immediately. And before we send you to the orthopedist, which you may not be able to get the appointment for a few days, let's see if it's a tissue thing. Let's see if it's something they can work out, rest. And what, what, what bothers me is this, this level of like generalization that goes on with most doctors where you go in there and it's like, oh, no, you hurt your back, you can't train. Or you yes. hurt your elbow, stop lifting with your upper body. And there's so many things that you could do. And, I'm, you know, and it's not the doctor's job, right? But I at least think it's the doctor's job to say, I'm not the one to speak to about this, but here's the number of a physical therapist. Agreed. There's these tests here that we don't know like it's not our it's not my client's job to know or even my job to go into the doctor and say 
are there any tests I should be looking at beyond this panel right now that's not getting covered under insurance? Because in my eyes, that's like an upsell, right? Like you go to buy, we've all been there, you go to buy a car. Do you want this feature, that feature, that feature, that feature? Well, I wouldn't be bringing it up if it wasn't presented to me. But now that you're presenting it to me, I'm checking those boxes because I want the Mac Daddy. I can't believe I just used that word. I want the Mac Daddy like performance package on what it is that I'm buying. And a lot of times in the medical field, I feel like people are going in that don't know to ask these questions and they may pull money out of their pocket to pay for a specific test. They may, you know, if they had this option presented to them, they may go explore that. But the problem mm -hmm. is with most GPs is that they're not really presenting. It's like, oh, blood work's done, checked, breathing's good, um, cough, great, done, get out. And you're like, well, is that really enough? And the fundamental problem underlying everything you just stated, Don, is, and, and, and oh, how do I say this? I, I think uh, as doctors, right, we have an enormous burden on our shoulders because for whatever reason, people, take what their doctors say as gospel when they right. shouldn't. And, and I, I don't think, I don't think you should take anything I say as gospel or anything any doctor says as gospel. I think what you should take as gospel is me telling you something, you asking me why, and me being able to rationally explain logically in an indefensible, uh, no, not indefensible, in an unassailable manner, uh, uh, give you a response that you can't necessarily shut down other than being like, okay, I'll give it a shot, right? And, you know, outside of that, I think it's very important I personally believe this, and I think all doctors should believe this, but you have to know what you know and know what you don't know, right? So what I mean by that, know what you know, know what you don't know, is quite literally that if somebody comes to me, like you just said, right, with an issue that I cannot diagnose, or I know that, hey, this is out of my scope of practice, this is not something I'm comfortable with, it's fine. Like, from an ego standpoint, why should my ego be so large as to not uh, not be comfortable with simply telling a patient, Hey, I don't know that, but I'm going to send you to somebody who does know that we're, we're going to investigate this further. We're going to dig deep. Right. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. Right. And, and doctors who are not able to put their egos aside, not able to confer, or I'm sorry, but not able to affirm what they don't know. And, being able to simply tell a patient, hey, we're going to figure this out, as opposed to throwing out this nonsense, right? Hey, stop, stop lifting weights, stop running. Hey, that thing that you enjoy doing, stop doing it. I don't care how much you enjoy it. I'm the doctor. You I'm, still I'm... become the source in my book. Like when you turn around, like the way that I look at it is if I come to you and I ask you a question and you're like, listen, I'm not the best person to answer this or even help you with this, but here's here's the number of so and so go contact this person in my eyes i'm looking at you as the as the source now it's like yes. oh wait i'm going to you know dr nick is the one who's going to be able to be the connector i'm looking yes. at you as the connector which in my eyes i i always kind of thought of, about gps as being the connector like they're the ones who are going to refer out for xyz i have a breathing problem i have a hearing problem something's going on i'm coming to you to find out Yet I just feel like a lot of times you're a lot of people that I speak to are getting a little bit of an FU answer when the doctors turn around and say, just stop, don't do it. Like, it's like, Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, Thank no, you for that. no, awesome. no. You're totally, you're totally right. This is, this is definitely something I'm passionate about speaking on because I just think, I, I think it's ridiculous. Right. I think that, you know, if, if, if certain, and I know I'm not, I, I say the word certain because not all doctors are like this, but if certain doctors would simply put away their ego and admit, hey, I don't know something. And instead of telling you, instead of giving you advice that may be maladaptive in the future, I'm simply going to, um, we're, we're going to simply identify this further. We're going to look into it, right? And the same thing with, the same thing with, um, uh, things that are within your your scope of practice, and you may not necessarily want to refer it out, but you don't know it at the time. I think there's no shame in telling a patient, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but give me give me a day or two. Give me a day or two. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to read some literature on it. I'll get back to you. There's nothing wrong with being forthcoming and honest enough or and honest uh, with your patient and letting them know when you don't know something. So, you know, I think that's definitely, that's definitely an issue. And 
yeah, my, my biggest pet peeve specifically in, you know, in this realm is just how many times have I heard doctors tell patients, whether it's CrossFit or running or weightlifting or, or powerlifting or any type of, any, any type of activity that seems to have, you know, some modicum of risk associated with it by the general populist, right? Because if you actually look at the objective data, there is objective data on how likely are you to get injured with Olympic weightlifting, with CrossFit, with, with powerlifting. There's objective data on this, right? Doctors shouldn't be relying on their emotion and their ignorance and say, no, CrossFit's dangerous. There's objective data. Go look it up. You can literally see what the rate of, I'm sorry, what the, I'm sorry, uh, uh, what the rate of incidence is as it pertains to injury. So uh, yeah, I think this just speaks to a broader problem of not, not knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know and then being comfortable in telling the patient, hey, I don't know this. I'm either going to find you an answer uh, through extensive research or I'm going to refer you out. So there. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, if you went to your doctor and you're a diabetic or obese, they wouldn't say don't eat. Uh, right. They would modify your diet, right? So, uh, so being well, well I, actually, we, actually, Derek, I, I have absolutely heard like literally. So, I I also have a business on the side of a service where I coach people with uh, recomposition, and I have literally been told by a couple of my clients that their doctors, especially female clients, in an effort to get them to lose weight, have put them on just flat out across the board, 1100, 1200 calorie diets. So basically telling them not to eat, uh -huh. which is ridiculous, right? I mean, I, I hear, I, uh, I can't even tell you the reaction I had when I heard this, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Anyway, just to, just, <laughs> you're to, just to hit that. Yeah, you're, it's, it's irresponsible. It really you're, uh, yeah. you're, you have to be, and there's a problem where in Canada here where um, we don't have enough family doctors. We don't have enough uh, general practitioners. Uh, and, and some of that is financial because they cap things, right? But, um, but you know, you have, it sounds like you have to be a great generalist and a great facilitator uh, and communicator. And, and is that difficult? Do you think that's not something that people want to work on? And maybe they're shying away and maybe doing a specialization is a little more focused and they don't have to worry about all this other stuff? Um, that's a really good question. I think, I think, um, so basically what you're asking, like the, the most fundamental question is, uh, the social acumen of a doctor, does that play a role in what they choose as their, as their, uh, sure. specialty? And I think to answer that, I think, I think that's, uh, um, I don't think I can answer that. And why, why I say that is I think that's just out of my realm. That's really something only God can answer. And why I say it like that is because it's, it's multifactorial. You know, what, pri what, what specialty you choose is multifactorial. Now, can I, can I absolutely say that your ease with which you communicate with patients plays a part? Absolutely. It absolutely plays a part, right? I, I, I mean, I remember there were med students who I, you know, went to school with who were literally uncomfortable talking to patients. And I thought that was hilarious because I was like, there's a literally, you could put me in a room with a flag, with a patient who's a flagrant racist. And I could, I could connect with him. I get, I guarantee you, I can connect with this man. Just give me a second, right? I can connect with him, right? So, so yeah, I think that it plays a part um, in what specialty you choose. I don't think that it's the deciding factor the overriding factor with most doctors but absolutely it's something that plays a part in and and i think that it should because you know um not not all of us are gifted in being able to communicate well with other people and 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 having the emotional intelligence quote unquote even though i really don't like that term uh or, or being able to having the social acumen to 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 kind of read people and connect with people and and cry with people if if necessary and um because i i've i can definitely count you know i've, I've cried with patients when you know delivering bad news and, and whatnot so yeah i think it's something that um, some doctors have, uh, some have in spades, others don't have. I don't know if it's something, to be honest, that one can readily work on. Um, and I say that, I, and, and I don't say that with certainty, because I realize that I'm talking from a place of privilege as somebody, as a doctor who does have that. So I don't know that, I, 
you know, I, I've never come across somebody, a doctor who is really bad with patients, and then they took a couple courses and got really good at connecting with patients. I think that that's something that you either kind of have or you don't. You know, I, I, I really refer to it, and this is it's such a great conversation. Thank you. But I really refer to it as when we speak to coaches, right? Like there's, I'll find that coaches are turning around and they're getting, you know, uh, FMS level 15 or they're, they're going on and they're taking their, you know, a specific certification course for the 10th time, just because it's been their craft and it's what they feel like is going to um, allow them to feel significant and allow them to stand out between others. But I think just like in any profession, you have to assess where you're lacking. And there are coaches that come in that are incredibly smart and they just, they can't have that discussion. Something that I think you have that, that, most people, it's difficult to learn is the ability to sit here and communicate and do it in a very confident, but like respectful way where it's probably very warm and welcoming to people who come in and see you. Most doctors though, you don't really, you know, hear them, you know, working on weak links or sitting there and assessing what can I do to become a better doctor? Like you are someone that I believe would say that, but there, there, there are very few there. And um, I feel like, like in any other profession, whether you own a restaurant, you know, like what are areas you can improve upon? Like, are you stepping out and looking in and saying, what are the areas that I need to improve upon? And if you can't answer that, finding someone who's going to give you an honest opinion of things that you need to improve on. I think just in life in general is something that a lot of people don't do enough. Oh, completely agree. I, I think that's just life in general. Hell, like let's extrapolate that further. That's something that even in Cross, I've been doing CrossFit for 13 years, right? I lift heavier. I, I'm no, how do I say this? I'm capable of lifting heavier than 99% of people who I see on a daily basis. Yet, even with that, I record all my lifts. I, I watch video. I throw it in slow-mo. I'm like tearing it apart because I realize that only through assessment like that can you improve. Oh, you, you need, you need that feedback, right? And I think, you know, ultimately, that's that applies as you stated Don, or as you alluded to rather uh that applies everywhere in life you need to be able to kind of realize that not only are you not perfect but you will never be perfect however that damn well shouldn't stop you from trying to get there every day right sure. um and and refining and and even though we can't be perfect we can be 99.9 and then obviously i think the the beauty of life is that kind of you have the chance to add more nines on onto the end of that right 99.99999 and as as far as you can go so yeah no I, I totally agree with you all right cool well listen do me a favor so uh dr nick thank you for being on here um could you let everyone know where they can find you on social media do you have a specific website if anyone has questions or want to contact you about doing a consultation what's the best way to uh go about finding out where you're at yeah so um so currently, as I, as I stated earlier, I am a, uh, I, I do see patients. Um, I am not licensed to practice in every state. Uh, so there are certain states where I'm not licensed to practice in. And if, if that is the case that I'm not licensed in your state, I cannot be your doctor. Otherwise, um, I absolutely can. The uh, best way to find me in terms of um, kind of a website is uh, www.steady md.com slash dr nick all one word d-r-n-i-c-k um otherwise uh i also see patient or not see patients i'm sorry see clients uh around the world actually not simply around the country because i don't have license restrictions but around the world uh specifically for um risk for for disease risk mitigation uh, pretty much any disease that has to do with metabolic syndrome, which there are a lot of, and I kind of wanted to speak on that because this metabolic health is something that fascinates me, but no worries. Um, but essentially, the, the service that I provide uh, works on, as I stated, metabolic health, uh, body recomposition, um, and uh, is, a, is a coaching service uh, that I provide. Uh, around the world doesn't there are no restrictions to where I can provide it and then otherwise um, my Instagram my main social media is Instagram and the uh, handle of that is uh, all one word the fittest f-i-t-t-e-s-t -T -T -E doc 
a DOC, the fittest doc on Instagram, uh, where you can send me a message and uh, we can talk further. If you'd like to either become my clients for uh, disease risk modification uh, and, and metabolic health optimization, or if you'd like to become my patient, if you happen to live in a state that I'm licensed to practice medicine in. Um, and yeah, definitely appreciate you having me on and wish we could have talked further, but I, I've, oh, this is I have our first, be... this is our, no, this is, listen, this is what, how Derek and I do it is we always invite the guests back on. I mean, we, we like to do the first conversation is more of a generalization, allow the people to get to know you a bit, and then we are more than happy to bring you back on at your convenience nice. to cover a specific topic, something that you're really passionate about or you want to deliver. But I think this was phenomenal. I think this gave everyone a real taste of what it is that you do and your personality. And I think that's step one. And then let us, uh, let us show some specific topics in the near future. Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll let you know when the content comes out and have a good lift. Yeah. Sounds good. I'm definitely going to have a good lift. I appreciate you, Don. And uh, take care, Derek. Take Thanks, care. Nice meeting have you. a good one. Bye. Yep, bye.